Hello and welcome to this talk on Chaos Zone TV or TV um, here on the RC3 2020. This talk will, but will be about uh, FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, and it will be given by uh, Pepin, Pepin DeVos, um, about his experience in documenting the GoWin FPGAs. Have a lots of fun and enjoy the talk. Hello everyone, uh, I will be giving a presentation about how to fuzz an FPGA, uh, but the short answer is it depends. So I will be mostly talking about my particular experience and hopefully someone gets something interesting out of it and try to apply it to their own interests, whether that is contributing to this particular project or starting their own or contributing to another one. Um, I'm Pepin de Vos, I'm a software developer and IC designer um, and my mission is to make better open source software for chip designers. Um, here's my website and the link to the project, what I will be mostly talking about, which is about reverse engineering the software of the Goin FPGAs. Yeah, nice. And I've also linked my Patreon and GitHub sponsor page, which helps me do this. Uh, so I want to thank all the people who are already supporting me, which is mainly Symbiotic UDA, where I did my internship on this project, and also these other kind people. So I will be talking, well, first about some background about how an FPGA actually works on the inside a bit about the open source tools that are there that we'll be working with and then about documenting these FPGAs through fuzzing and decoding um, and why I say documenting here and not reverse engineering um, and then some results. So uh, an FPGA, well programming logic devices in general, uh, you start with some hardware description language generally, mostly VHDL and Verilog and then you do synthesis which goes through to a net list of logic blocks such as AND and OR gates and other things uh, and flip-flops which are sort of the memory, the state of the program uh, and the way this is implemented then on the FPGA is through uh, lookup tables and multiplexers where uh, a lookup table is basically a piece of memory that stores uh, the truth table of a certain logic, logic operations and then there's this flip-flop for the memory and uh, multiplexers which are used to uh, route these connections to neighboring tiles because uh, inside the FPGA are sort of you know, a whole grid of similar tiles with some exceptions for special purpose blocks for DSP and memory and those kind of things but the core is really uh, like logic tiles, which are generally um, a collection of lookup tables and flip-flops, which you call together a slice. And then there is these routing multiplexers that connect various in the outputs together. And the way they connect is by uh, intertile wires mostly. Um, so this uh, tile has connections to one, two, four, eight tiles in any direction neighbor, neighboring to it. And you can connect anything to anything almost. Like it's not, not any, everything to everything. They try to kind of optimize how much you can connect. Because yeah, if you would connect everything to everything, it's a lot of multiplexers and it would take a lot of area. And uh, already these multiplexers take off the majority of the slices. So the FPGA designers really try to uh, optimize how much multiplexers they can get away with. So you also generally see that the more advanced FPGAs have actually less multiplexers because they have better software. <laughs> um, so let's take a look now at the software that you generally, how the, how the process works from VGL 
to the distributed load on your FPGA. And of course, the first three, uh, the first step is the programming language, and then there's these synthesis tools like, well, for the commercial ones, it's Quartus, Vivado, ISE, and then the open source ones. Uh, the popular one is like uh, the Yosis, which uses ABC for optimizations. Uh, and then this outputs in that list in various formats that are supported by uh, the tools. And then there's a place, place and route step where you map these uh, logic elements to a specific location on the FPGA and connect them. And uh, in open source tools, this is sort of separate where you have this, you take the sort of assembly language of the FPGA and generate it to an actual bitstream. Um, but in the commercial tools, this is generally one step where you just input your netlist and you get a bitstream out. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of the things that need to happen if you want to have an open source tool flow for your FPGA. So yeah, the first step is synthesis, which is in this case Yosis. And this is, well, it's, it's work, but it's just, you know, software. You know, you, you, you can open the documentation from the vendor and you see all their uh, primitives and you write synthesis for them and it works. Like there's no uh, digging involved into the software really or like figuring, yeah. It's just, I, I don't want to get too much into it, but it's, you know, yeah, a work, but a, a, just writing software. And But for place and route, the vendors generally don't really tell you how the, exactly the FPGAs work inside, so it's a little bit more difficult. And that's why you'll see that Yosis has support for a ton of FPGAs and also other things like ASIC. Um, so they also support Silex, uh, Altera, uh, all the, a lot of FPGAs. Well, next is much harder, so uh, they started with Claire Wolf and the Ice Storm project for the Ice 40 FPGAs, um, which then got expanded to the uh, ETP5 FPGAs, also of uh, Lattice. And these are the two main architectures currently supported by NextPinar. Um, but there's work uh, going on to expand this to, well, go in, in my case, and some other projects that are also working on this. Uh, but what NextPinar does not do is generate the actual bitstream, so we need this extra step um, where you take sort of the assembly language from NextPinar and turn it into an actual bitstream that you can program to your FPGA. Um, and what this talk is mainly about is figuring out the bits you need to do the next PNR bit, where you place and route all these multiplexers and lookup tables and flip-flops that are inside this FPG. So to get started, step one, <laughs> get the license. This is uh, an unfortunate part of commercial FPGA development is that you have to get the commercial software and this can vary how it works, but for going, you have to fill in this form, and it can be a slow process. And it, from what I've heard, it's uh, preventing some people from using it. In, for example, in university, when you have your whole classroom wanting to work on FPGAs, and you have to, you know, w wait a week for your license to arrive, it's not a very uh, nice process. So this is also where open source can be really uh, advantageous. Next step is of course get an FPGA, or maybe, yeah, depends on, maybe you have one already, but the nice thing about Cohen is uh, uh, Sipid released this really, really, really cheap FPGA board, so, you know, you can just spend five dollars and you have an FPGA. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> but yeah, the this is second because you don't immediately need it. The first part is just, you know, getting the software because only once you get your software working can you actually use the FPGA. And then actually install the software, which is also not trivial in some cases because, yeah, there's oh yeah, software for Linux, software for Linux, uh, Windows, Linux, but in reality, Linux in the EDA industry means Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So if you are on Ubuntu or Arch Linux or whatever you have, you are probably out of luck. Um, so that's why I wrote, if software says no, delete that SL because they ship is fairly old, like 
C++ standard library files that don't work on modern Linux. So you just delete it from the bundle, then that uses your system library and it generally kind of works. And then the first step is really boring, just read the manual, to try to use it as it's supposed to be used, and try to get as much information from it as you can. Um, because like everything that's already there, you don't need to you know document yourself, so it's really a time saver. You spend some time here, basically. Um, the goal of this step is basically to find a way to take the lowest level input that you can generate and automate it and then get as much information as the generated reports as you can. And for going this means um, they have a TCL shell which you can write scripts to input uh, netlist, verilog, whatever and then synthesis and place and root it. Um, their synthesis tool produces a Verilog netlist. So and then yeah, so the, the lowest level you can go in this particular tool is uh, place and root this netlist, and then constrain every single cell you put into it to be in a specific location. So you have sort of a deterministic output. And well, the, the positive side of this particular FPGA is that their bitstream output that goes into the programmer is an ASCII format. So I mean, it's not human, like human readable. It's still like binary. It's really weird, but it's it sort of the framing is already done for you, so you don't need to sort of look in the hex editor. Um, the downside of this uh, particular tool is that the other outputs are kind of useless. So yeah, there's not much info on timing or routing or anything that you could like extract useful information from. Um, we'll get to that later. Also. Um, now on to fuzzing. Fuzzing on an FPGA basically means you generate a bit stream, you change the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest bit of information configuration about this bit stream, generate another one, and then you compare them, and then you know that okay, this this minimal change that I made resulted in this one bit flip or whatever, and then you can sort of start to make these connections. What the meaning of uh, all these bits are. And then you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. So that's the basic idea. Um, so the step one is you write a netlist in here about uh, yeah, this very log netlist that uh, you go and IDE uses. It has the yeah, module and then this LUT4 primitive, which is a lookup table with four inputs, which is what uh, Go and uses. It's a LUT4 architecture. Um, and then it has a 16-bit, so uh, four to two to the fourth uh, uh, sort of memory where you put the truth table in, which is a parameter that you can tweak. Uh, and then you just you know you write it to a file and you. So in the beginning, I just read this really stupid sort of bash script system where you can just you know you run set on the file to replace this init parameter with an actual value. And you just loop all the combinations and see which bit changes or something. And the other thing you need is a constraint file because you want to place this LUT in one particular location so you know okay that this location corresponds to these uh, bits in the bit stream. And then you also update this location to whatever you want it to be because you want to end in the end you want to you know find all the bits of course. Um, then you make a TCL script that reads all these files, runs the PNR, uh, you get your bitstream and whatever else output you want. And then you look at the bitstream and see if you can make sense of anything. As I said, for Goin it's well, relatively easy because they have this ASCII grid of bits. So there's this header which is just like fairly constant, I just ignored it and copy pasted it to, for myself in the beginning. Um, there's some checksums in there, but meh. Yeah. Um, and then there's this giant block of bits that are just like, yeah, <laughs> they get mapped to the FVJ. Um, you see to the left there is a 
yeah, some bit of padding and then it starts with the actual bits. And then I found, or actually someone else found that had looked at this before me, that at the end it has a CRC check to ensure it is transmitted correctly. And then there's more padding at the end. Um, yeah, and then there's a footer which I left off here. Um, it's worth noting that for the more bigger FPGAs, uh, I've heard it's more like a command stream, a command stream so it's not as easy to like, change one bit and see the resulting bit because once you start moving stuff around the command stream also changes so you need to yeah deep deep dig some deeper to understand this command stream before you can actually map bits to each other um, but that's the basic idea and this for going was relatively easy the trials said in the beginning it depends on the FPGA like there's no one guide you can write like do these steps and you end up with a free open source tool chain it's a lot of discovery and trial and error um, I wrote this little Python script that takes these bit streams and makes a nice image out of them, or nice, it makes an image out of them, um, where here you can see all these little uh, lookup tables, which are the squares with the flip top next to them. Um, yeah, from there, this was like basically a big nump numpy array, and then you can just XOR two bit streams and you get the difference bits, which is how I sort of figured out the differences. Um, so yeah, congratulations, this was your first fizzling of a bit. Uh, yay, only a million more to go. And uh, this is kind of a problem. So this each PNR run like takes a couple of seconds, up to a minute depending on what you're doing. Or even longer if you're not constraining everything of course. Um, so if you can imagine, you know, this FPGA grid is like a lot of bits, millions maybe, maybe a less, this is a relatively small FPJ. Um, so if you take a minute per bit, um, you will be there a while, even if you have this beefy computer, multi-core, it'll be slow. So, you need to be a bit more smart about it to make some real progress. I mean, with this you can already do some fun things, like you can, for example, tell the vendor tool to generate a bit stream, um, and then you just can see, okay, this was an AND gate, and now I make it an OR gate by just manually flipping some bits and then you can test it on your FPGA and see if it works um, but if you want to get really something practical you of course need to understand a lot more bits um, and to make this more practical there is the binary trick, it doesn't have really a name or anything um, <laughs> but, but the idea is uh, okay so, so imagine you have I don't know, these little bits, there were 16, but here's like 8 to fit on a slide. 8 bits that you want to find a location of, normally you would, you know, flip one bit to a run, to another bit, blah blah, very slow. It would be 8 runs in this case. Um, but what you can also do is, in each run, sort of assign a binary number to each bit, and then flip them according to this binary number, so you can see A is off in all runs and then B is like 1 and then C is 2 and D is 3. Um, and this way you can um, only like log 2 runs for a number of bits, which is of course much more efficient. The problem with this approach is not all combinations are unique. For example, there are bits that you're not testing, which will all, always be null zero all the time so these will not show up if you're testing A here and the other there's also some bits that are always on no matter what you're doing and in this case H is also one all the time so that's a bit of a problem the other problem is that some bits have weird combinations of relations to single features you're tweaking so it might not be always a one to one relation to the thing you are tweaking in your code and the thing that shows up in your bitstream. So in this case a simple example is uh, B or C which conflicts now with D so you wouldn't be able to tell D apart from A and uh, B and C. Um, that's a bit of a problem. For example it shows up in IO banks like every side of the FPGA has an IO bank which can turn on and off. So if you turn using any input output buffer any pin on any side it enables this whole bank 
um, if you use this binary trick, uh, this bank will always be on basically and you will never figure out what this bank bits are. Um, so you need to be slightly more advanced, which is the balance, balanced constant weight code, <laughs> uh, which is sort of a Hamming distance related thing. Um, but the simple explanation of this is that for each number, the number of one and zero bits is always the same. So in this case, there's always two zeros and three ones in each number. And you can only imagine that then if you have the end of two of these numbers, or the or, it will have more than three or less than three uh, ones in it. So already you don't have a number with all zeros or all ones, but also um, logical combinations, there's some technical term for this, but most logical combinations will have also a unique uh, code to them so that they don't conflict with your other bits that you're testing. Um, this is always unique, and but it takes a bit more runs than the binary trick, which is a fair trade-off, I think. Uh, I'm not, not exactly sure what the complexity of this one is, but it's still better than you know straight one-bit runs. Um, the only problem is, so except, imagine you are now fuzzing these input-output buffers. You're going through all of them, but you're always like enabling one of them, for example. Um, and this would mean you never see the bank going off. So you need what we call meta fuzzers. They like sort of the fuzz, the a collection of other fuzzers, basically. Uh, so you add extra runs that deliberately trigger these more complex relations. So you have to sort of yeah. Well, you can write a check. So okay, I found a, 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 a combination that I don't understand. For example, the end of two bits. And then you can give an error, and then you are like, okay, what is this? And then you can <laughs> find a hypothesis and write a meta fuzzer that says, okay, I expect this bit to be the end and or of these other bits. So I expect them to have this pattern. And then you have this meta fuzzer that specifically triggers this pattern so that you turn on these uh, combinations of bits and more complex relations. And this you also do with these uh, constant uh, weight codes, but there's only one here, so you don't see that. But um, yeah, that's meta fuzzers, they are kind of tricky. Um, yeah, so that's an overview of fuzzing. Um, a roadblock that I ran into with Goin is that there's no control or insight into routing. From what I've heard from like ICE40, ECP5, uh, other FPJs. Usually you can either control where you want the wire to go or at least you can like inspect which routes the vendor tools choose. And either way you can then sort of correlate these things. Um, but it appears, as far as I know, that Goan doesn't offer this kind of control. So this makes it almost impossible to fuzz the routing because you can't like you can't change a single like a simple thing, you can't have a minimal change that sort of changes the wire it uses. You just have to sort of rely on the router to pick a different one and sort of push it a bit in the right direction, which is really a pain. Um, so the solution is to also look at the files provided by the vendor. Um, so this vendor has yeah, this tool, and of course they also have data files that describe their FPJ. Um, their binary files not documented at all. Um, the favorable thing for a Goin IDE is that it doesn't have an end user license agreement, like most of the like Silex Altera kind of tools that prohibit you from <laughs> messing with them. So I'm I'm not legally saying anything about this, but this makes it quite like a kind of okay maybe to have a peek at them. Um, so yeah, I, the, I complemented this uh, fuzzing with looking at the files the vendor provided. Um, so yeah, so basically the goal was to reverse engineer this file structure and write a parser for it so you can extract the data from it. You can do this in several ways. You can just uh, stare at the hex dump and try to make sense of it. 
um, and my internship supervisor actually was like a superstar at this who could just like stare at this hack dump and see immediately all sort of things and like how did you do this but uh, I'm not such a superstar at this so I kind of went for other approaches first is to run the program in GDB you can just like set breakpoints on things and see if you can extract some information from the memory in the program and also you can decompile the program and look at the assembly in something like Vitra. I don't know how you say this. Um, so for example on GDB one thing I did was uh, okay, you run the TCL shell uh, you let it start up so you don't get all the startup noise and then set the set a breakpoint up on the F open call. Um, continue, run the place and route, and then you you know continue, continue, continue a few times, and eventually you find this interesting function call where uh, it reads the route data table. So there's some debugging information left in this library, which is convenient, um, and it yeah it points to this uh, data file of the Cohen IDE. So I yeah open the draw and uh, look at this root node table class and uh, turns out that it's it reads this file like straight into a struct no encoding no decoding just struct and to disk and struct from disk um, but it had all these getter and setter methods that are like exported as symbols so I could just like take the setter name and the address it was pointing at and this would directly correspond to data in this data file. Um, it was a bit laborious going like through the data file, getting all, all the setters and make it into a little Python script. But in the end, you get a Python script that can extract these things and at least have some names to them. Um, the other fun thing I did was sort of write automated GDB scripts. Like you know, normally you use GDB like interactively typing into it, but you can also just tell it to load scripts and this script in particular uh, breaks another function that reads another type of data file um, and then it breaks at every read out of this file and tells you to offset into the file and how much bytes were written and the function they were written from uh, so you can sort of correspond these functions to the addresses and blah 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 and then this, this, this particular file was more of like an archive with tables and different things in it more of like an actual file structure that was a bit more involved um, but then you write a parser for it and you can extract this data uh, unfortunately data is not equal to meaning so you have this bunch of binary numbers and you don't know what's going on and uh, they also did some interesting techniques where they encode that data as like decimal digits of a binary number interesting um, but okay you can look at this data and you have some names from the exported symbols uh, the simple ones are like the LUT bits they're just you know <laughs> bit, bit one is this but um, a bigger challenge was routing which was the key thing that I wanted to do this for and um, this in the end I managed to figure out and extract the routing information from this uh, FSE file but it wasn't completely uh, brilliant solution, but for example, the IO buffers they tend to be very complex in FPGAs. They do a lot of different folders levels, different modes, different everything. And then I started up making sense of all these random fuses and things. And then it turns out they're also different per FPGA. And I was like, oh my god, okay, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, so then I went back to fuzzing. Uh, the nice thing is. Yeah, once you have the fuzz or the, the chip data, the fuzzing becomes a lot easier because you kind of know what you're looking at. So you have this from these data files, you can sort of extract the tiles, and you know, okay, all these tiles are of the same type, and there you know their boundaries and you know their size. So you don't need to duplicate all the fuzzing work for each and every tile. You can sort of fuzz each tile separately. Um, so this leads to some simplification and speed up where you can. Uh, yeah, first per tile, basically per tile type. 
So yeah, in this case, the lot bits and the basic routing was from the vendor data directly, no fuzzing involved. Um, but the IOB and uh, data flip-flops are fuzzed, basically. Um, so what I did in this case, this was like my third fuzzer with first, you know, the batch script, then I did the uh, binary tricks, and then I had this tiled fuzzer after the, fuzz, uh, after the chip debate decoding. And uh, what I did here is, yeah, you take like, you know, okay, you have all the modes that you want your flip-flop to be in, for example. So you say, okay, I have tiled type 12. Um, for each flip-flop type, put one in every tile, first like run the PNR and then you extract, uh, you know, you go back to the tiles and see all the different modes that this, this particular flip-flop flip -flop can be in. Um, so you do this per tile type and you can go much faster and you don't have to do all these binary tricks. Um, what you do have to do is logic for combining as much different uh, fuzzers into um, as, as little worms as possible to optimize for speed. This can be quite confusing and complicated and I think the limiting factor here was uh, the output buffers because as you can see in the middle there's a few that are only like a specific type so you need you know <laughs> you need all the types of IOBs that you want and this particular tail type you need to do it for this tail type and there's only one of them so it's kind of slow but it's still more uh, efficient than all these binary tricks because you, you only have to do it once per tile type basically. Um, the hard part um, was the clock footer. So I didn't talk to Miss too much about this yet, but um, in FPGA you have like the intertile routing, which is like these wires to neighboring tiles. But there's also uh, like global routing, which are generally used for clock trees and resets and other like high fan out signals that you want to cross your whole FPK. Uh, in the uh, go in there's like eight of them. And well yeah. Their muxes are in the chip DB. So in this sense you have the basic data. But like okay so for the for the intertile routing their names are kind of obvious they say you know there's like north two tiles number three, so it's the third wire, you know, sort of like the information is encoded in the name. For the, for the clock router, it's not, like it's very um, irregular also. If you see here, like these, these horizontal lines are spines, they go from the center tile where every global signal comes in from the PLL and the input pins, and then they sort of spread out across, across this spine column. Um, and if in each spine column there is one multiplexer that connects it to a tap, which is just like a vertical running wire. Um, but there's only one tap per column, so um, you have to kind of figure out which which column is connected to which spine, basically. And you can see here, sort of like one, two, one, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But you don't know that, so you have to write fuzzers that are basically take up the whole FPGA where you just sort of scan flip-flops across rows to see which spine they get connected to. And also this, this local, uh, local like horizontal branches they're called. Um, they spread out a few tiles from this step, but it's also kind of irregular how far they spread and which step they connect to. So again, this buzzer has to sort of sweep <laughs> flip-flops across it in several hundreds of runs okay. to uh, see which row connect to which branch and then to which step and which spine. And in this picture I drew like the four primary ones and there's also four secondary ones and it's a big mess. Uh, so this was some recent work that I did that to improve the global clock browsing and I'm now working on this next VNR part to uh, incorporate that. And uh, yeah, after you've done all this fuzzing on the style decoding, you can sort of figure out the tile format. And you can see here at the bottom, <laughs> eight rows or what? Four maybe? Yeah, I think four actually. Well, a few rows. There's like the LUTs and the, the flip-flops. 
and then everything above it is just multiplexers. It's like, you know, 80% multiplexers. <laughs> Which is, I mean, like, even if you knew that there's a lot of multiplex, this was just kind of still like a wow, shocking moment to see how much it is. Um, yeah, this is just a picture I'm, I generated from this fuse file where you just color everything differently and the memory, memory wrote the labels on top of them. Um, pretty picture, not that insightful. Um, yeah, then you can start to generate these. Uh, placements and routing for the stuff that you decoded. And you have your full, fully open source FPGA toolchain. Um, this particular one is running a RISC-V core that is calculating primes and it's running on this uh, Go-In board of trans electronics that's also laying behind me here. And uh, yeah, that's my story. And this is Project Apicula and it's on GitHub, you can check it out, contribute, uh, start your own FPGA reversing engineering project or join some other one or, well, I hope you enjoyed it and thank you for listening and I think there will be a Q&A after this. So this concludes um, the talk, thanks. Um, very, very much, uh, Pepin. Very, very interesting. And of course, there's questions. Um, one question that comes from the IRC channel is, um, does the GoWin software provide a simulator for which useful data like timing or so could be extracted by just observing the simulation process? Uh, yeah, so thank you. Um... The, they do not provide their whole simulator. They do provide a uh, timing file, like not, not they, they provide behavioral models for Verilog. So you can take your Verilog models from them and simulate it, but that's behavioral simulation. It doesn't include timing data. There are some encrypted models somewhere floating around, I think, but there's of course encrypted. So you can't easily extract timing data from them. Um, so then it's easier to just decode the timing database that they also have. Yeah. All right. Um, so, because I didn't see another question, thanks um, again for your great talk. I see that you have a talk right now as well on the same channel. And um, thanks again uh, for the people who still want to ask questions to Pepin. Uh, just go to the um, RC3 Chaos Zone uh, channel and uh, ask your questions right away. And um, yeah, Pepin will try to answer them as well. Thanks again and see you soon. Bye bye.